Kids don't do art. They do pictures. When people ask what I would do when I grew up, I said I will draw pictures. I don't do art. Ooh, okay. Very ooh-worthy. I see you, Eric Carl. I see you. No, we will see Eric Carl later. His ghost is coming to the studio. No! <laughs> okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Oh my gosh, how scandalous. <laughs> You're listening to Dada or Nothing, a variety show about the visual and performing arts presented by Hippie Pink Ferret. I'm your host, Jojo, and this week, we're going to be playing trivia. Today, I'm joined in the studio by educator and personal friend, Maddie Oldham. Hi. And also in the studio, we have painter, train wreck, and sister from another mister, Ms. Jerusha Wright. Those are the three most amazing describers I think I've ever been attributed, <laughs> and I love you so much. I really appreciate you two being on our inaugural venture. To celebrate the occasion, I've prepared a two-part trivia episode on today's subject. This first episode will have a more biographical angle to it, while the second will go on to talk about how this history informs the artist's creative philosophies. So that being said, are either of you nervous about the game? Games are my favorite thing. I like to live my life as if it is one big game of Clue, but I'm just trying not to be the one that gets murdered. I'm feeling thrilled and I'll be honest, a little competitive. So looking forward to it. Sorry about that, Jerusha. Oh no, I'm up for the challenge. I've had three cups of coffee today, so I'm not sure if this jitteriness is the caffeine. Or just the vibes. (laughs) Or if that's just how I am baseline. You girls sound like you're ready to terminate the competition. Let's go. Initiating two-player game. Please set team names. What was your favorite book growing up? Stregonona was a classic, and no one can come for me Stregonona with that. is that girl, and she'll always be that girl. She was that pasta pot. I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> she was that pasta she pot, was that baby. Pasta she was that mm-hmm. pasta Stir me up. Um, I went with the lesser known classic, The Giant Jam Sandwich. I don't know if either of you are familiar with this book. I've never heard of her. I would love to hear about her. The Giant Jam Sandwich is an excellent novel in which a town called Itching Down has a wasp problem and they decide to bake a giant jam sandwich and trap all of the wasps inside of the sandwich. So you watch the town turn buildings into ovens to make this giant loaf of bread and they get a crane and they put all the jelly on the bread. Apparently the wasps are stupid and don't know, like, maybe I shouldn't go there. They're like, oh, okay. So, not to spoil the giant jam sandwich for, all, <laughs> for your adult listeners, but three wasps do get away. Ugh. Where they are now, no one can say. I'm devastated. I am simply wondering how we built that many ovens and didn't burn the entire place down. Yeah, the fire department was like, that's fine. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> fire codes, who needs who them? Who needs them? At least for me, my favorite book was The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Yes. Um, yes. By Eric Carl. I remember that because Eric Carl was the first author that I liked so much that I memorized his name because I wanted Aww. to read more of him. Which is funny because you don't really need to know his name to recognize his work. It's pretty iconic and standalone by itself. Unfortunately, he did pass away back in May of this year in time oh, of recording. Oh, wow. Wait, yeah. really? Yeah. yeah, he was like in his early 90s. While I was reading about his legacy, I was struck by some eyebrow worthy figures. By the time of Carl's death, The Very Hungry Caterpillar had been translated into over 60 languages and sold over 50 million copies. That's a copy for every single person living in Spain with enough left over for the entire population of Jamaica. Oh, no big deal. Today we're going to be following Eric Carl through his life so we can understand how he developed his iconic style and why it works. I'm hooked. I'm ready. I'm feeling good. Names approved. Today's competitors are Team Giant Jam Sandwich versus Team Strega Nane. Now reviewing game rules. I will occasionally interrupt our conversation about Eric to pose a trivia question. Most are multiple choice and worth a certain amount of points. However, when we do encounter an open-ended question, there are two ways you can go about it. Make your best guess and succeed, you'll double your score plus three extra points. No penalties for being wrong either. But if you're stumped and feeling frisky, you can make the question multiple choice by going dada or nothing, meaning you risk your entire score. Choose correctly and you double it, pick poorly and you're left with nothing. Listen closely to our narrative for potential potential hints on these brain busters. You're like a sneaky professor and I love it. A I'm super the, sneaky super professor. Sneaky are, you professor. Re- are you ready to learn kids? Because I'm ready to learn. I read 18 books on it. <laughs> After eight normal questions, we will wrap up our discussion and go to our final round. I will pose the most difficult open-ended question in the game, and once that's solved, we will see if you are worthy of a place in the Dada Daddy Hall of Fame. Oh my word! I did not know the stakes were so high. I know. The stakes are very high. Okay, okay. 
Don't sweat it if you feel like you know nothing about our subject. I've done my best to relate it to a slew of different categories. In fact, today you can expect questions on geography, politics, and art history, to name a few. Rare. Don't... <laughs> <laughs> Please make all cat sounds closer to the mic, thanks. Put some feeling into it, you know? I'm sorry, I'm gonna want to pull you back, not push you forward. Did you mention we all met doing theater? So that will, I think, read throughout this episode. Game start, good luck, and may the best daddy win. Eric Carl's father was learning the ways of city management in his hometown of Stuttgart, Germany. Once his training was complete, he'd hopefully rise to the ranks and end up as a customs official, just like his father. He was forbidden from pursuing a career in the arts despite the fact that he had demonstrable skill as a draftsman. It just isn't respectable to stay in your room all day drawing, his father often repeated. Don't overlook the benefits the state bestows upon its faithful servants. Once Mr. Carl realized he'd never share in his father's enthusiasm for the work, he jumped ship onto a literal ship, specifically one heading towards America. Sadly, he couldn't convince his Joanna to come with him. For two years, their entire relationship existed as letters sent back and forth across the Atlantic. The first LDR that I care about. But every charming doodle wore down her hesitancy, and soon enough, a 19-year-old girl who didn't know a word of English found herself leaving everything she knew to marry the love of her life. The two of them settled in Syracuse, New York, and in June of 1929, 13 months after the wedding, as the new Mrs. Carl was quick to point out, they welcomed their son Eric into the world, named after his father, although they dropped the H at the end. They wasted no time. No, girl, they were ready. They, they were. said, we are living in America. Bring me child. <laughs> child now. <laughs> Did I mention, I didn't come here for nothing? How was Eric spelled otherwise? It was a more German spelling. Oh, Eric. <laughs> Eric. <laughs> Eric. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, he just, he had a cold that day. <laughs> <laughs> He was born with a little sniffle. I'm sure savvy historians may have noticed that last year. Yes, baby Eric was just in time to see the stock market crash. <laughs> That's just good timing. It's just <laughs> awful timing. Where were you when the stock market crashed? Fresh out the womb in Syracuse, New York. How about you? I was like, what is this whole autumn business? <laughs> Stock market crash. Does it do that every season? No, sorry. We're in Syracuse. We call it the fall. <laughs> <laughs> That's some topical New York humor for you. Our maybe out of state audience might not get. Oh my God, I'm suffocating. <laughs> so yes, baby Eric was just in time to see the stock market crash, but his parents did pretty all right for themselves during the depression. His mother had saved up money working as a maid for a wealthy family and his father spray painted washing machines for a steady $40 a week, which in 2021 dollars roughly translates to about $800. More than your average public school teacher, yeah. It might come as a surprise to hear that books never played a large role in Eric's childhood. He does fondly recall listening to his folks read the funny pages aloud, but his most prominent early memories are of weekend hikes with his father. Eric's parents, like most Germans as he puts it, worshipped the outdoors. Thus these miniature expeditions into the woods surrounding their home ended up becoming a sort of education about the intricate details of nature. Mr. Carl would show his son how to tell if a foxhole was still being used Used or ask him to peel back the bark on dead trees so they could examine the creepy crawlies underneath. Here's a question, no point total, no point total, just a cash question, super cash. Was there anything you did as a kid that scared the hell out of your parents? I'm trying to choose one of them. I was going to say, you, you can take the lead on this one, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> What's the spiciest one? We were in this like sandbox and I got super dirty, so my mom had to change me. But before she could do anything, my two-year-old ass just booked it and was like running through this huge music festival. So you fit right in at Firefly. And instead of like stopping the child that was running away, they would stop her and be like, do they have sunscreen on? <laughs> They were like, let this kid rock, but please protect against the UV. SPF of nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Not a damn thing. <laughs> I would have to say, I wasn't a very wild child. I, I was afraid of upsetting adults, so I didn't do a lot of crazy things. You could say that that's still true about me now. <laughs> but <laughs> I remember we had, this is so random, we had a pipe in our backyard. Like a loose pipe. I don't know. Like I'm, coming out of the ground? No, no, no. Like I'm sure it was like from an old swing set or something. I thought it was magic. And my neighbor and I would pick up the pipe and slam it onto the ground because rust would come out. We're like, what is this orange powder? So I would be like trying to pick up the rust to like, like, like sniff it, examine it. My parents were like, oh, please. 
<laughs> please don't do that. That is oxidized metal. Please stop. Please don't do that. Ma'am, 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 ma excuse <laughs> ma me. Ma'am, excuse me. This is rust. I'm like, but what if it, and I'm like putting it near my mouth. They're like, ah! no, please don't. <laughs> Tetanus who? Yeah. So I like to explore much like it sounds like Eric peeling back the bark, doing all those things, which was very okay until I tried to huff rust. And then apparently it was no longer okay. <laughs> Eric has a very cute one. So whenever Mr. Carl had vacation time, these informal lessons would continue at a campsite that Carl's frequented with their small circle of friends, a group composed mainly of other immigrants. It was here where one afternoon, Eric wandered into the woods by himself and encouraged a snake to slither into his hands. Perhaps he had grown too confident from the times he had let salamanders do the same, but thankfully it was a garter snake. Although he didn't know that, inevitably neither did most of the adults when he then brought it around the campfire and they all ran screaming in fear. <laughs> My man's over here going like, ya da da da, come here, da da da, and everyone's like, stop. <laughs> no, Eric. <laughs> His friends are like hiding behind trees <laughs> and Mr. Carl walks over and he's just like, ah, ah, silly boy. I don't know why he's Dracula, but he goes, silly ah, boy. Silly boy. Ah, 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 ah. Question one. Category is geography. This question is worth two points and is multiple choice. This aforementioned campsite was built around one of 11 narrow lakes located just south of Lake Ontario, and the New York region they exist in is named after them. What is the collective name for these lakes? Is it A, the Glacial Lakes, B, the Finger Lakes, or C, the Iroquois Lakes? You have 10 seconds to answer. Maddie, what was your answer? I said A, no fingies. So you said the glacial lakes. I did. I said B, the finger lakes. Jerusha, give yourself two points. No! It was B, the finger lakes. Team Giant Jam Sandwich Zero, Team Strega Nana Two. Mr. Carl often laughed off his son's antics, but Mrs. Carl attached a great importance on discipline. Back in her home country, there was a strong tradition of using corporal punishment on disobedient children. She never hit Eric. Hold your horse. <laughs> I see your horses. There is no evidence that she ever hit Eric. He speaks very lovingly of his mother, but she definitely internalized some of the philosophies behind this method of child rearing. Here's a quote that Eric attributes to his mother. A child must be broken before he is six years old after that. It's too late. And here's the thing. As someone who teaches first graders, I kind of get it. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my God. Like, not the broken part. Like, I don't agree with the breaking. But sometimes you see a child bouncing off the wall at six. And then I would see him again a couple years later. And I'm like, you figured it out. But I still see her in you. Like, I still yeah. see her. <laughs> yeah, so you can imagine how pissed off she must have been when one day she receives an invitation from Eric's kindergarten teacher to have a conference out of the blue. He must have done something outrageous. Why else would she be asked to meet in person? Soon she's waiting outside Miss Fricky's door digging her heels into the floor as she paces. Once she's asked to enter the sun-filled classroom, she sits down and steals herself for the worst. And then the teacher started boasting about how well her son was acclimating to his new environment. She took Mrs. Carl back into the hallway and gave her a guided tour of the drawings she had hung up, born of Eric's love for the large sheets of paper and fat brushes that lived at school. While Mrs. Carl had noticed them, she hadn't made the connection that the Eric who signed them was her Eric. Miss Fricky ended their one-on-one -on -one by imploring the young mother that she should encourage this interest. That's an amazing educator right there. From then on, whenever Eric reached for his paints or busied himself with crayons, even when he shirked saying hello to his parents' friends to do so, Mrs. Carl would soften. Don't bother Eric now, she'd say. He's in his room with his pictures. Although no exceptions were made when Mr. Carl's mother finally came to visit. Oh, German grandma. Yeah, we got Grandma Sophie coming along. Grandma Sophie! And um, well, she causes just a lot of trouble. And she's not even in the story all that much, but this is her defense finding moment. She's like played by one of those actresses that's like really famous, like a dame. Absolutely wreck the film for yeah. any other actor in it and leave. Mr. Carl had traveled over with his sister and later sponsored his brother's immigration as well, meaning the majority of Grandma Sophie's children now lived in the United States. And in her eyes, it made no sense.
parents. Everything is good back home, she pleaded at each one of her visits. All three siblings nodded their heads and rolled their eyes in secret, thoroughly unconvinced to go back to the lives they traveled halfway across the world to get away from. But when she visited the Carls, Mrs. Carl genuinely nodded when her mother-in-law claimed the Depression was losing its grip on Germany. Unemployment was at an all-time low, inflation was eliminated, no one was going hungry. How? Mrs. Carl asked. A rising leader, Grandma Sophie said proudly. Adolf Hitler! Oh, um, <laughs> no! Not the rising leader Adolf Hitler, just, not that. Just Adolf Hitler. Certainly not that. The visit planted a seed of homesickness in Mrs. Carl, which grew in the following months. Mr. Carl may not have been moved by his mother's tales, but his wife wanted to go back, and well, that was that. Mr. Uh, Carl was like, I'm not a Nazi, actually. <laughs> I'm not interested in returning. <laughs> I'm good with the bugs in Syracuse. I don't need the I don't need the white nationalism, actually. Thanks. <laughs> I, I, I got a house. I got my washing machines. I got my bugs. I can't believe you're discounting my bugs. <laughs> Most people with any choice in the matter were going the other way. Eric later wryly remarked. At future family gatherings, Mr. Carl glowed when he recounted stories about his life in America. He would never make it back. Eric was six when they arrived back in Stuttgart. Question two. Category is foreign languages. German. This <laughs> <laughs> it's German. <laughs> Give I me swear, the points, bitch. I swear it's German. <laughs> This question is worth two points and is multiple choice. Eric's grandfather hung a large e ren er kunda above an ornate chest in his living room. What is an e ren er kunda? The spelling is E H R E N U R K U N D E. Is it A, a military medal, B, a religious tapestry, C, a type of firearm, or D, a certificate of honor? You have 10 seconds to answer. Jerusha, what did you come up with? I chose D, the certificate, as it sounds like this is like post World War One Germany. They were acting like they still won. Solid reasoning, Maddie. I chose C, big old gun, because you described it as a large one, and I, I'm using context clues, which is a fourth grade reading skill. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it. Could, I was between a, a big old gun and the religious tapestry. Maddie, as much as I love your reasoning, no. Jerusha got it correct. Are you kidding me? This is Eric Carl's paternal grandfather, husband of Grandma Sophie. I uh, should have um, known. He's the customs official, if you remember, back in the beginning of our story. Mm -hmm. So he had a certificate of honor signed in big blue letters by Chancellor von Hindenburg. Also, the Roman numerals is really... <laughs> Offensive and that your points are now IV and I have a big old goose egg over here. Call <laughs> our goose egg. Uh, that's fine. Team Giant Jam Sandwich Zero. Team Streganana Four. <laughs> Game paused. Uh, sorry guys, I'm gonna have to pause us for a second. It's the band's lunch break, so Dada or Nothing will be back in just a bit. The Carls lived in a four-story house owned by Mrs. Carl's parents, each floor filled with a different set of relatives. It wasn't long before Eric started the first grade. His classroom was a cramped space with narrow windows and hard pencils, lorded over by a man who warned the children to not make mistakes. You remember the app Tiny Tower? You could design each floor to be something eclectically different. And I'm just picturing his house like, floor one, grandparents, floor two, <laughs> the uncle, <laughs> floor three, the grandma. Like, it's just this chaotic list of... of... Uh, a lot of the women in the house were were World War I widows. He had an aunt who lived with her parents, but she didn't really know where else to go because she had married pretty later into life. And then he got shipped off to World War I and then immediately died. So she was left just with this baby. Oh. Hashtag mustard gas. Hey. Keep that away from my sandwich. <laughs> Uh, so, despite the fact that this place felt like it was intentionally designed to be the opposite of Miss Fricky's in every way, Eric's optimism held out. His classmates were fascinated to have an American in their midst and helped him learn how to speak German. Yet, none of them could help when three days in, Eric was the first to make a mistake. Oh, no. Oh, no. You sound like a, whoa, wipeout. Sorry, man. Oh, no. Oh, no. Nice try. 
He wasn't sure what he did or what to expect as he stood in front of the class. The only thing he knew was that he was told to stick his palm out. The teacher, armed with a thin bamboo switch, struck it with all his might three times. As painful welts erupted from Eric's little hand, he was told to present his other palm. He decided then and there that he hated school. Can I just say, this explains a lot about his mother. Yeah. She thought this was the only way to raise a child. I think we also have to remember, though, that contextually within, like, the world of education, that was deemed okay. Like, I don't want us to, like, internationally be like, oh, those Germans, they do be hitting people. It's like, no, no, no. We <laughs> were hitting people in America oh, yeah. through the 70s. People really forget that corporal punishment has only been out of the American school system truly less than 50 years. Like, it, right. that was, like, a staple of parenting for a very long time. Yeah. But it's interesting how now it's so easy for us to pass that value judgment. Truly, it was just universally accepted. I didn't even do justice to the teacher as a character because Eric really goes into, like, how much this guy just straight up terrified him. Especially juxtaposing it to his kindergarten teacher and just, like, pedagogically, the way Germans and the way Americans viewed education at that time was so violently different. And Mm -hmm. he also has that isolation of being an international student, which whole nother can of worms. He already is this fascination toy to play with. Like, ooh, we can gaslight him into Heiling Hitler. See what happens. And on top of that, the teacher is like, oh, fresh meat. Exactly. Like, I will show how good of a teacher I am by being able to whip this kid into shape. Like, he becomes the project child, you know? Yeah, that's actually exactly what happened. Yeah. He, the teacher, explicitly said that it was his mission to break in him as a kid, and apparently it worked because Eric's next report card said that he was a very obedient child, but he should learn how to participate more. I can definitely see how that would translate to him wanting to teach empathy and understanding to kids through his books. Oh, God, this is all coming together. It's all coming together. (sighs) Yeah, so he went home that night and asked his mother to write a note that permanently excused him from his education. Mrs. Carl... That is baller! He was just like, I'm not fit for this. And she was like, I... (laughs) Mrs. Carl did, in fact, write a note, though it probably didn't contain what her son requested. It might as well have, as his teacher would have reacted the same way. Eric watched helplessly as the man foamed at the mouth and turned purple from screaming so hard. After that idea literally blew up in his face, Eric decided to bide his time until summer arrived. The end of the academic year did not provide the respite he was looking for. A medical examination conducted by the school determined that Eric was too thin. He was sent to gain weight at a convalescent home presided over by kindly ladies they named aunts. For a point, this little <laughs> aside question, as a last ditch effort, what do you think these kindly aunts did to the kids who had trouble packing on pounds while they were there? All right, Maddie, go first. What did you write down? I said, would not allow the students to leave the table or play until they had cleared their many plates. That's an excellent guess. Thank you. I had the exact same answer. Uh No, wait, how did you phrase it? I said, Granny said, finish your plate or else. Finish your plate or (laughs) else. I was like wondering if this is where you can't leave the table Table. unless it's done. Really started. I really like the place that we went here, and it's funny that they're the same. So I'll just give you both a point. Oh my god, I'm on the board. Team Giant Jam Sandwich 1. Team Streganana 5. You did catch on to the theme, but it's worse. Uh, did they just force feed them fudge like Augustus Gloop? Kids who didn't pack on pounds were sat in their laps and had lumpy semolina pudding forcefully shoved down their throats. And if you were wondering, no, vomiting did not convince them to stop. The women would quietly clean up the mess and get right back to it, and Eric would fail this end-of-the-year physical two years in a row. Oh, no. No. The hardest of no's. Eric asked his parents when they'd be returning to America on a daily basis, as you can imagine the little kid doing. Hey, mom, you know what's crazy? In America, I got to draw my pictures and no one shoved a spoon down my throat (laughs) until I vomited. Any chance we could go back there, please, with the snakes and the bugs and the kindness? I'm going to leave a scathing Yelp review. (laughs) The aunties were pretty, but also the worst humans I've ever met. Zero out of five stars would not recommend to a thin friend. Upon the realization that their noncommittal answers meant that he really was stuck in this situation, he began fantasizing about how he'd grow up to be a bridge builder. His first project would be one that stretched across the sea from Stuttgart to Syracuse. With that finished, he would grasp his favorite grandmother's hand and head back home. I don't want to paint a disingenuous picture. Walks with his father continued into interesting places. They actually 
went up to Solitude Palace, walked up and like toured around and then they went to go get lunch. They would do that all the time. So the walks are actually kind of a little bit more exciting. And he would often be sent to live with wonderful relatives. My favorite among them were Aunt Mina and Uncle August. Eric would go visit them on the weekends. He had to take the tram over and he would have to wind up August's thinking machine, an imaginary lever next to his temple. And he'd do like, and this is what he'd say when the thinking machine was up. Halt, I have a story for you. <laughs> halt, halt. All kinds of ridiculous yarns followed as they passed the time painting and stuffing themselves with meat as cooking. A uh, classic was how he and his friend Buckle, practicing Catholics who were born to Catholic parents who were raised as Catholics, somehow found God and were converted to Catholicism. We live in Germany. We are German. We continue to live in Germany. And then one day we're like, you know what we should try? A beer. <laughs> Later, host, I've been wearing a belt this whole time when I could have had suspend. Oh my god. <laughs> my god. I'm just so stupid. <laughs> In fact, given enough time, Eric might have grown to love his life here more than his one in America. He had plenty of reasons. However, something was happening in Germany. Oh, really? Uh, what, what could it be? I feel the rumble underfoot. <laughs> <laughs> its first tangible manifestation, at least from Eric's perspective, happened on the usual route he took to school. One day, he turned the corner to find his local department store cordoned off by the police. Its windows were shattered, and glass spilled out onto the road alongside damaged toys, clothing, and furniture. Eric couldn't help but notice that a large star of David had been painted across the entrance. Question three. Category is Fuck. world history. This question is open-ended. What Eric witnessed was the aftermath of a widespread riot that took place in 1938, in which Nazis vandalized or outright burned down hundreds of synagogues and other Jewish-owned properties. What was the name of this incident? I'm going to go for the open-ended because I think I know what it is. So I'm going to write mine down now. I, I would like to go for Dada or nothing. You have 10 seconds to answer this question as open-ended ended. Maddie, what did you write down for your open-ended answer? I specifically wrote the Dresden bombings. Obviously, it was bombed at the beginning of the war, but it was one of those places that was like attacked early on anyways, so that's where I just went. <laughs> Well, again, there's no penalty for being wrong, so your score stays exactly where it is. Fabulous. All right, Jerusha? Yes. Dada or nothing? <gasps> Dada or nothing. There are three options for you to select. If you select incorrectly, you will lose your score. But if you select correctly, you will double your score. What is the name of this incident? Is it A, the Night of Broken Glass, B, the Vom Wrath Riots, or C, the September Pogrom? You have 10 seconds to answer. Going to go with B. B. You are locking in the Vom Wrath Riots. <laughs> I am so sorry you were incorrect. Ah! It was the Night of Broken Glass, wasn't it? It was the Night of Broken Glass. As soon as I you that said that, I remembered poetic. it. So people were being outspoken about not liking the Jewish population, but a lot of the policies were not directed at causing violence or having institutional violence quite yet. And then in France, actually not in Germany, a 17-year-old had heard his parents were exiled to Poland, even though they'd been living in their family home in Germany, and that's where this guy was from for years. So he shot Ernst vom Rath, the German diplomat in Paris. Goebbels used the event to stir supporters into an anti-Semitic frenzy and close to 100 Jewish individuals were killed during this event and over 30,000 Jewish men were sent to the developing concentration camps. The violence is not included in the policy but then you start to have people reading into those policies and noticing that there is not anything saying you can't be violent then it becomes that loophole which is arguably even more dangerous you know. And so what Hitler did was just like look at this mess we are finding the Jewish people for the destruction of Germany that our supporters caused I to kill this you. Now, yeah. It was the mark of what was about to happen. Honestly, like as somebody who's been to the Holocaust Museum seven times, the fact that I don't have this off the top of my head, wow. 
It was weird though. I went there every single day for a week. And um, yes, I was absorbing the information, but it was so much more of an emotional experience. I was so wrapped up in seeing these artifacts and reading about personal stories that the like, history of it just absolutely went over my head at a certain point. Honestly, I had never heard of this event because I was like, oh, Nazi Germany. Like you, th- you think you get a general gist by how much of an impact it's made. I feel like a lot of my information about this period of time is personalized to the people I heard about because these are people who actually shared stories about it. I I don't feel like the Holocaust is taught well. Our experience learning about it in a public school setting, it's not taught well. Not a lot is taught well in high school history, but that's another topic. Team Giant Jam Sandwich 1, Team Strega Nana 0. So, yeah, did not know about that event. No. Um, and so Germany's about to get pretty serious about this World War stuff in a hot minute. In fact, the following year, Eric's family vacation was cut short by news that their country had invaded Poland. Mr. Karl was drafted on the very first day of open hostilities. Eric, of course, missed his father, but he admits to being comforted by the rising tide of propaganda. It seemed like every day Hitler's mesmerizing voice claimed another country had knelt before Germany's might, and he prized autographs he snagged from war heroes such as General Rommel. When propaganda works, it works. It works, baby. But in time, the news carried more death announcements than ones of victory. Stuttgart became cloaked in drab camouflage paint when it had become a major target for Allied bombings. Citizens dug tunnels to hide in because night raids were so frequent that people couldn't figure out how to reinforce their homes in time. In the end, a solid half of Stuttgart was leveled. The now 13-year-old Eric continued drawing and painting in his spare time. He still possessed a stalwart stance on hating school, but he quite enjoyed his art teacher, Herr Kraus. Krauss taught a strict curriculum provided by the Nazi regime. Art had to be realistic and naturalistic. Aryans with a flag and proud farmers. Eric would later describe. But Eric had trouble merging his own ideas with such concepts. The quality of his work was loose at best and sketchy at worst. Krauss took notice of this deviance and invited Eric to his private home on the outskirts of town. The Nazis, Krauss said shortly after the boy arrived, they are charlatans. They have no idea what art is. The teacher then pulled out a neatly wrapped box from a hiding place. Inside were reproduced productions of colorful and abstract pieces of art, works by Picasso, Matisse, and many other degenerate artists. Eric was utterly appalled, but couldn't break himself away from their strange beauty. Krauss had been a part of the modern expressionist movement. Oh my god, German expressionism! Okay, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, he was a part of all that. He was juicy. He liked Eric's style, but couldn't publicly encourage it. Don't tell anyone what you saw today, Krauss sternly warned. Just remember the freedom of expression and the quality of its execution. He knew he was putting an immense amount of trust in Eric to not turn him in. Luckily for him, the boy did keep the paintings he saw a secret and stored them in his thoughts to obsess over. I don't know why, but hearing about the people that found their own ways to like keep themselves alive and keep that expression and keep that just humanity and like vitality. I think there's something so relatable about having this deep need for art and deep need to survive in a place that may actively discourage knowledge for specific purposes. The LGBT community found a way to survive. People living in Germany found ways to survive. And they also found other ways to help each other survive. We're big fans of Krauss here. I love Krauss. I know what you're thinking about the narrative so far. It's very heartwarming, but when the hell are we going to start talking about the Very Hungry Caterpillar? Yeah, I'm ready. In the interest of time, here's a lightning round of 10 awful things that happened to Eric between now and the next part of our story. I love a good BuzzFeed article. <laughs> so, <laughs> Top 10 uh, terrible things in Eric Carl's past. Mission start. One. In the interest of preserving the future generation of Germany, Eric is evacuated from Stuttgart and ripped from everything he knows. Two. The desperate war effort starts conscripting literal children, so Eric is placed on a bullet-ridden train that takes him to dig trenches on the Siegfried line. Three! Whoever is in charge forgets to feed him, and the only reason he doesn't starve is because some friendly prisoners of war share their rations with him. Four! After he develops sores on his legs, Eric is discharged and told to return to Stuttgart on foot. Watch out for the Allied planes that'll kill you on sight. Five! He immediately gets drafted upon arriving back, but good thing his mom refuses to let him go because the unit of teenagers he would have been a part of deserted the second they saw American tanks and then were hanged for treason. Six! Soon enough, the French army is marching through town. The war is about to end, but not before some dick soldier mugs Eric for his watch and shoes. Seven. 
This mysterious postcard says Mr. Carl is in a POW camp located deep in the Soviet Union, and we have no idea if he's okay or when he'll be back. Eight. Eric has to smuggle cigarette butts out of his new job working at the denazification department of the United States military government. He trades them on the black market to provide food for the four floors of family members he lives with. Nine. If you hated school before, you'll hate it even more when you can't follow the material because you haven't had a stable education in six years. Time to drop out. Ten. Ten. Despite the odds, Eric gets accepted into a prestigious art program headed by Professor Ernst Schneidler. However, he's expelled because his professor thinks he's pretentious and the least talented student he has ever taught. Mission complete. Awesome. Awesome. Wow. Wow. A round of applause for Trauma. Yes, Trauma. She made her debut. What in the actual flip? (laughs) Yeah. I think you're a deck. So like leave. In Professor Schneidler's defense, Eric said that he walked down the street making like, you know, that little movie that like movie director Just square. Let him, let him live his unoppressed artistic so. dreams. Oh, I'm sorry. This Eric. prisoner of war wanted to be a caricature of an artist and we're just gonna say that's not okay. Let him, let him live his life. <laughs> let him live. He sold cigarette butts. Let him hold his fingers up in the air to make a picture. Sweet uh, flipping. I am processing so much. Oh, uh, Eric was 16, by the way. So he, At this point in time, he's 16. Yeah, he got into college 16. He dropped out, remember? All of those 10 points happened in four years? His father left when he was eight. And now we're 16 in college. Can we also get a big shout out for his mom again? Who, while before we may be like, ooh, she's strict, she's whatever. But she was like, you are not going to war. And that saved his life. So shouts out to Mama Carl. Yeah, she straight oh, yeah. up lied to the yeah, Nazi official. fully lied. Like, badass. Like, put her life on the line. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. you know, Eric wanted to go. Really? He wanted to go. It was it was really that deep in his mind. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be a war hero. After that last incident, Eric had to work in the typesetting department for three semesters. Eric later approved this move wholeheartedly. He felt it channeled his vanity into a constructive force and taught him how to economize in his designs when he did eventually become an art student again. Schneider's students were prized in the commercial art world, so towards the end of his academic career, without even looking for a job, Eric worked as a graphic artist for the United States Information Center. After he left, he was scooped up by a fashion magazine to be the art director of the promotions department. Question four. So this is genuine trivia. This question is worth one point and is multiple choice. Finish this quote made by Eric in his book, Artist to Artist. I try to express the essence of my stories and ideas very clearly using simple shapes, often in bright colors against a white background. You might almost think of my illustrations as what? A, little posters, B, controlled explosions, or C, finger paintings. You have 10 seconds to answer. Maddie, what did you say? I went with C, finger paintings. All right, Jerusha, how about you? I wanted to be the fingies. You wanted to be finger paintings? I wanted to be the fingies. I am so sorry, neither of you are correct. Is it controlled explosions? Is it B? Uh, No, it was A. Um, What the? You might think of my illustrations as little posters. That would make a lot of sense because they were literally in the poster marketing department. Mm -hmm. He worked as a graphic designer. Yeah. That's what he was doing for the United United States States. Information Center. He made them a series of posters that comprised his portfolio. Team Giant Jam Sandwich 1. Team Streganana 0. At the Academy, I finally breathed again. The creative that was dammed up in me was released, and I could finally get started. Eric now had a solid portfolio and a decent resume. All he had to do was finish his studies before he could embark on his childhood dream of returning to New York. That's when he received word that Mr. Carl would be on the next train home. Eric rushed to see his father for the first time in eight years. Mr. Carl arrived in rags, weighing no more than 80 pounds and shaking with malaria. He would spend the next decade in and out of sanatoriums. Eric had trouble relating to his father from then on. He said it was as if Mr. Carl didn't belong to this world or his family anymore. Their last memory together would be the two of them waiting for another train. They were heading to the hospital where Mr. Carl would later die. Neither of them spoke a word. When reflecting on the moment, Eric would say, In my mind, I recalled the happiness he had offered me in my early childhood when he passed on to me his dreams, which he had not been able to fulfill for himself. What do you guys think of the story so far? 
tragic. So many individuals have a direct connection to the Holocaust, like Hitler, German. Like when I think of Eric Carl right now, all I see is that joy that he describes having in early school. I'm curious as to how the more tragic experiences will reflect in his work. So I'm I'm hooked. I'm very interested. Uh, so when we return in part two, we'll be accompanying Eric on his move back to America and delve into some reasons why we're so obsessed with him. Thank you, Break. Going into the act break. Dada or Nothing is a production of Hippie Pink Ferret. And I've been JoJo, your host. Thanks again to my guests, Maddie Oldham and Jerusha Wright. Sources and links, such as one to a transcript, can be found in the show notes. If you like what you heard, why not keep up to date with our studio on Facebook or Instagram at Hippie Pink Ferret. That is H-I-P-P-I-E Pink Ferret. If you really like what you heard, consider becoming a patron or making a one-time PayPal donation. You'll get a shout out, unlock exclusive content like access to our private Discord server, and every bit of your generosity allows me to keep the lights on and provide more content. I do write, edit, and produce everything myself right now, so any little bit you can provide to the field of edutainment is very much appreciated. Custom music by Alec Rice. Additional songs and sound effects provided by Mixkit, Zapsplot.com, Descript, and Envato Elements. All audio used is free to use or properly licensed. Again, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen. Remember to find reasons to have art in your life.